And what if this is just a big time-wasting tactic intended to evade from the real issue? Surely that couldn't be the case. Another real problem with this particular fallacy, the presumptive assignment, is the ease with which it is turned around. On the video about Pascal's wager, this character I described previously shortly went on to tell me that I was working with a pan-human concept of God, which is apparently not the right one, and I needed to read a certain book. One other character and I expressed some hesitation about taking him up on this claim, and he presumes to tear into us about our alleged fear of learning something which might challenge our preconceptions. I told him that I know that the book in question has absolutely nothing relevant to contribute to this particular discussion, and if he doubts this assertion, he may examine my proof by watching every last one of my videos and favorites, as well as all the videos and favorites of all my friends, subscribers, and subscriptions, twice. I reassured him that, if he does all of that, it will become apparent to him, but if he doesn't, it's because he's scared of learning something which might challenge his preconceptions. He tried to give me a presumptive assignment, and I returned the favor. Pardon me while I digress for a moment. If it's true, as this character alleges, that I was using the incorrect sense of the word God, that's especially interesting. You see, the sense I was using was precisely the same sense being used by old Blaze. So if this sense is incorrect, then that's just one more problem with the so-called argument. Now, coming back from that tangent, if disagreeing with the position someone else holds entitles you to dictate how that person spends his or her free time, it entitles that person to return the favor, to reciprocate the imperative. The simple act of declaring my argument incorrect does not mean that you get to tell me how to spend my free time. This is unfortunately also a common tactic among Christians and Muslims when they, when they insist that I will become convinced if I read this, that, or the other book. Now, let's be clear about this. There are no rational reasons for believing in any gods. Now, let me qualify that. You see, I'm not just saying that I've never been given any. I'm saying that there are none. Any rational reasons for believing in any gods do not exist. Perhaps you're wondering how I could possibly conclude this so certainly, since, after all, I couldn't possibly have discussed it with every believer in the world. I couldn't possibly have read every text on the, on, on the subject. Well... After spending a few years being given the same absurdities over and over again, the same completely irrational reasons, I am left to conclude that, if there were rational reasons, they would be common knowledge among believers. One who has any rational reasons at all to believe something has no need to rely on a laundry list of irrational reasons. Clergy are educated people. If there were rational reasons to believe, they would know about them, and would make them common knowledge among their followers. The fact that this is not the case is all the evidence I need. Let's say that someone gets to you in a younger, more naive, more credulous period in your life and tells you that, at the very bottom of a certain pile of elephant droppings, lies a gold nugget. Of course, being intelligent, you recognize that the possibility exists, so you track down the pile in question and start digging. Of course, it's not until you get to the very bottom that you realize that the individual who told you this was either deliberately lying, deceived, or mistaken. How are you going to react the next time someone comes to you with this claim? What if people come to you with this claim over and over again for a few years? Let's not kid each other here. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. After a few times, you'll stop buying it. You'll learn your lesson. Now, does the possibility exist that the next pile of dung might be the one which really contains the gold nugget? Well, I suppose. But are you really going to insist on sifting through them one by one just because the possibility exists? Is that really practical? Is it really worth it? No. Oh, but if you don't have that nugget to tip the bouncer, you won't be, won't, won't be able to get into the party. Well, you see, to believe that, I would first have to believe that the party's going to happen, and I don't. Well, if you don't have the nugget when the party starts, you'll spend the rest of, et of eternity being walloped on the caboose with a two-by-four. You don't seriously expect me to believe that, do you? I mean, you're asking me to believe one thing on the grounds of another thing, which I don't believe. Well, can you really afford not to believe it? I mean, what if you're wrong? You risk the two-by-four, for eternity. Was this really the best arrangement they could come up with? I hope that party's gonna have headache medicine. Sounds to me like a good way to get a lot of naive people covered in elephant dung. You have the nugget, but you will not see. Well, okay, I've digressed again, but you get the idea. Given my tendency to expend a tremendous sums of thought with very little provocation, I tend, it seems, to be more susceptible to this than to others. In my case, other monstrous failures of reasoning make very useful red herrings. Ah, but here I have a punchline as well. I don't remember which, but in one of my videos, someone accused me of trying to be confusing by relying on a lot of 
multisyllabic terminology. A multisyllabic terminology? You mean words with more than one syllable? Words like, I don't know, multisyllabic and, oh, say, terminology? Is that what it means when someone relies on words with more than one syllable? That he or she is trying to be confusing? Interesting. Why is this chucklehead doing it? <laughs>